so I'll focus on on one sort of aspect of this, right? Which is uh, the synergy between a, an MSBA program and the MBA program, right? So, um, like I told you before, this was a defensive move on our part. The school was seeing declining enrollments; they needed to make up, uh, you know, make up ground. So we launched Masters of Professional Accounting a few years back. We launched Masters of Finance and MSBA, and both are launching now in the fall. And we have another Masters coming up in a year or so. Um, so. I realized early on that the differentiation for us, right, and the strength that we have since we have a MBA curriculum, right, that we've been teaching for 30 years is going to be this business context. And the thing that Ram mentioned is that we want a product where you can put these people in front of your customer, right? And so, you know, obviously, computer science, information schools, they do these two pieces, right? And so we said our strength is we have the whole MBA program, so let's do this really well, right? So unlike a lot of programs that are lockstep and have like 12 required courses, uh, we actually built in 40% uh, of, the, of the program is elective. So there's a lot of room for electives. And the whole idea was, let's see how our MBA program can help, help MSBA, and how can our MSBA program help MBA, right? So we really wanted to create this synergy, and you'll see how we do that. So when we started out, right, I looked around and found that there were people in marketing who were doing well, of course, in IS, right, we were doing empirical research, but not really machine learning. Uh, and then we had people in marketing who were doing, obviously, empirical research, but also there were some GIS-type courses and so on. And then, of course, we had people in operations doing revenue management and uh, optimization and uh, supply chain analytics, obviously. So how do I build, all the, you know, build on this, the uh, capabilities that we already have? So... Um, uh, anyway, let me actually skip. To, so one idea was let's offer a program where the students can pass through the program, right, and do like what Rajiv has, a business analytics sort of, uh, you know, training. Or they can go through this and do more of a marketing analytics. Or they could actually do operations analytics. So the idea was to offer enough flexibility that they can choose what they want to, you know, specialize in, leveraging our MBA courses, right? Um, Okay, so leveraging the MBA curriculum, I think, became a, a very dominant sort of thought uh, around this. But of course, then building on that, we, are, we, we hope to sort of provide guidance for the certification programs. We do have the STEM certification. The other critical piece that we have in this program is this capstone project. And it's uh, unlike many other programs, it's actually a six-month pretty serious uh, sort of a, 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 you know, a component. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that. But... Um, you know, obviously, like many other places, we do have a, a variety of anal analytics platforms. Uh, we have Python, we have R, but we still have Weka. We have access to, um, you know, IBM Bluemix and Microsoft Azure. So I have actually formed, you know, made agreements with, with IBM and Microsoft and so on. And the instructors will have access to these platforms. And it will be, like you said, up to the instructors to decide what they want to use, right? Um, so this is the overall sample program. And you can see here, there's a quite a bit of room for electives. So luckily, we have quarters, so that chunks it up nicely. We have a summer session to five weeks, and then fall, winter, and spring. Um, where there's a room for one elective here in the fall, two electives in winter, and two electives in spring, right? So they start out in the, in the summer session two with a really solid statistics for data science course. And I found this guy in uh, e uh, economics department who has a joint department with stats. He's going to teach this stats for data, uh, data science course. Um, there's something called Jupyter Notebooks. So he's not using SPSS or SAS. He's using Jupyter Notebooks. I'm sure some of you are familiar. Uh, and then I'll be teaching this other course. And the thought that I have for this course is um, it's like a mini capstone project, right? And the thing that Rajiv talked about, right? Soup the nuts. You need to know how to clean up the data, to visualize it, to do some right machine learning. And so what I'm going to do is give them, you know, and, and so that's the end delivery. They're going to take this data set, which is quite messy, and they have to use R and Tableau and so on to go through all of these steps. So along the way, they're going to learn R. Along the way, they're going to learn some SQL and Tableau, right? So that's, that's my goal with, with this course. Um, so uh, coming back to this theme, and then we have all these other required courses, uh, fairly standard. Uh, but again, uh, uh, the, the synergy, right, M MBA versus MSBA. While we have a number of electives that are going to be designed from scratch for the uh, you know, analytics program, uh, such as advanced data analytics, big data management, uh, and so on, but I had to be very creative. Who's actually going to teach all these? Because I couldn't just go out and hire a bunch of people, right? So we are being creative about this. So the big data management course is actually a chair professor in computer science who's going to teach this course. 
and now he has uh, he uh, you know a lot of uh, strength but I had to work with him to move it from a computer science orientation to more of a business school orientation and so uh, if you take this mastering predictive modeling this is going to be taught by um, uh, you know a, a CEO of a company here but but he he has training in economics he looks at you know the world from our point of view as an economist but then he uh, so he's going to use Alteryx and Tableau and do that. We have people in operations who are already teaching supply chain analytics, operations analytics. These classes are already full in the MBA program, so we're going to offer different sections of these. And since it's a different section, it can be optimized to the analytics student, right? Uh, marketing on the internet, again, very popular in the MBA program, so we'll have our own section, marketing analytics. Um, this is a really interesting course. Um, it's a more of a managerial course in analytics, and the idea is that uh, the, the guy who teaches this is going to be a visiting professor who was actually our own graduate, is also going to mentor the students about how to think about the certification, how to structure the problem for the capstone project, right? The things that Hemant is talking about, and teach this in the winter and continue on to the spring and, and continue to mentor the all these student teams as they work on their, uh, uh, on the capstone project. Now, this is the other thing, right? So, we found all these MBA electives that we were already teaching that uh, students you know, would be interested in, in the analytics program. So we have marketing research, new product development, right? These are all courses that we were already teaching, revenue management, decision analysis, Vijay has this course on edge. So analytics students can then enroll in these classes, right? Um, so the, the, the logic is that if it's an MBA class, it will be optimized to the MBA audience, and analytics have to take that as given. And if it's an analytics class, guess what? It's going to be technical. So if you're an MBA student taking it, you better know that it's going to be a little bit more technical, right? So that's how we've, we've done this. Um, OK, the Capstone project, um, they are going to do it in winter and spring. And during the winter, they're actually going to figure out what they're going to do. And they look at all the different projects available, learn software, learn the platform that they need to use, right? Uh, uh, and then winter is when they, uh, spring is when they'll actually do the work and by the end of it, you know, create the deliverables. Um, we're working with a, a number of, uh, you know, companies to come up with these, uh, these projects. Um, uh, so one, uh, we have on June 14th an information session, uh, uh, you know, sort of a joint event sponsored by us and by them, where they have their entire Rolodex. I have my Rolodex. So bringing all these people into the room so that in one shot we can sign up a bunch of projects. So I'm trying to sort of do some economies here. So questions, right? And of course, we'll open it up here. But these are some questions that I have, right? How much big data should be required in the curriculum, right? I know that already I was hearing that Hadoop is becoming old-fashioned. We need to move to Spark, right? Now, should everybody l learn these big data things? Is it an elective? Initially, we are going as a, with it as an elective. But it's open to anybody. Everybody could do it, or some of them could do it, right? Uh, how much data management or data warehousing from what I'm seeing, right, beyond SQL, you're not really getting, right, getting into normalization. They don't really need to go down that path. Same thing with data warehousing. So I think I know the answer to that. But then there are a whole bunch of questions about this, right? Um, in our school, we're trying to create these economies where all the master's programs are being run by shared staff, right? Is that the appropriate way to do it? Or should you have an academic director and an executive director, right? Um, so how much specialized sort of personnel do you need? I know um, Ravi uh, talks about his lab, which has the executive director and a technology person. Um, so how much sharing can we do? How, many how much of dedicated staff do we need? Um, any, any suggestions on how to source experiential projects in a scalable manner? I'd love to hear from you guys at UT Dallas, 600 students. I mean, his uh, entire program is like a discussion section. In <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> they could lose 45 students and not even know the difference. Um, is how do you scale this, right? If every student has to work on, on teams of the project, right, how do you scale this? Uh, uh, and maybe Ravi has something to say about that. Um, and then I find this really fascinating. Um, we have lit 44 acceptances, a little bit more than you. 44 people have given the deposits. 42 from China, one from Taiwan, and two from India. Okay. <laughs> then I talk to these guys and they say most of their students are from India. Yeah. I said, let's do a swap. <laughs> uh, and, and then uh, you have more of a balance. You guys are attracting some more domestic. So, well, we were very, very late in the market. We literally started in February, uh, March, right? Uh, we didn't have a website, nothing. Uh, so it's very, very, so that may be the reason. But how do you actually attract more domestics? Just give them more money. Uh, 
Yeah, if I may respond uh, uh, or take yeah. up that issue. Yeah. Yeah. I did not mention our numbers, but they were very much like what Ram described. I said 55% female. But the, we split in those same three categories, 50% were international, another 30% with domestic degrees, and 20% domestic. But the challenge in getting domestic students for us was not just having applications, but they were, score, you know, basic scores were just too low. Same thing. And our, inter our selection process was, you know, it's a business analytics program, right? And with, with all of that business stuff I showed you there, so the process is very geared towards recognizing skills other than quant and tech knowledge. And yet, uh, so I think, and this is some, something somebody brought up earlier, I think as a community, we've got to start going to what the math STEM education did for elementary and middle schools. Ultimately, to get domestic applications at work, you need to fix what's happening <coughs> in the school system. Uh but you know, I mean, if you look at, somebody mentioned UT Austin has a very good balance between domestic and international. Certainly if you look at, or North Carolina State, I'm sure has mostly domestic. So like, how do we tap into more of that? UT Austin does what the NBA do, they basically buy the students. Buy the students. So you know, here's the thing. We had this one applicant, American applicant, right? And we got into a bidding war with UT Dallas <laughs> over him. This is a student that I didn't even want to admit. The scores are so low, right? But then I find out that UT Dallas is giving them like $40,000. I said, okay, let's give 15000 No, I started 10, 15. Finally, we, we didn't, I said, one American student, what are you gonna do, put him in all, like, all the session in front of, this is our program, I mean, come on. Uh, so anyway, we have to figure that out. And I think Ravi gave me some good ideas about targeting Indian students. There are some fairs that happen in India and you need to time it in the fall and, and, and target that, right? Okay, time.